What if, I wondered. What if it didn't have to be speed that I injected? What if I could find something that was just vaguely in the same ballpark? It didn't have to be perfect. It just had to be better than nothing, right? Instead of realizing that this meant no one had ever done it and lived to tell the tale, I was so desperate for a fix, I decided to take that completely untested drug, ram it in my veins, and make myself the guinea pig for the entire human race. It was time for injection roulette. So, welcome back, YouTube. It's finally time to get back to the chaos, to the ugly sorts of stories most people would rather leave festering in the past, and YouTube certainly doesn't like to monetize. So, with a huge, huge thank you to the Patreon people for keeping this project feasible and afloat, Take your seats, ladies, gentlemen, and everything outside and in between. It's time for volume two. The Nostalgia Project, the stories that came before, they lived fast. They deserved to die young. But the truth is, I didn't. I lingered on way, way past my expiration date. And this, this is the mess that followed. <laughs> The struggle to survive in an adult world I was never cut out for. In a body I'd run into the ground at just 22. So, welcome to the real world, little fetus. We're all grown up now. It's 2007. The MySpace era is rising up. Twilight's hitting the cinemas. And me? Well, I'm in mourning. Not for a person. We were too young for all that. Our bodies and friends still seemingly indestructible. What died was something so much bigger than any friendship. It was a part of me. It was a fucking era. Heaven itself came crashing down in a shattered mess of halos and mangled angel wings. And I would live among its wreckage for so long it nearly killed me. What I mean is my raver era. Its pulsating, bloodied heart had been torn out. Ecstasy, pills, molly, whatever you want to call her these days. She'd left me. She'd been my personal saviour, I always thought. Rolling taught me happiness, dragged me out of my eating disorder so easily it was never even a struggle. But when my body couldn't hack it anymore... Those sessions of bliss and glow sticks, airwaves black gum and menthol cigarettes and dancing, dancing. Well, the light of sober day was brutally bright. I went to the same clubs. I listened to the same tunes. I danced with the same people. But that elation, that magic, that soaring neon midnight swirling round my head, it was all gone, robbed like a busted halo till it felt like I was dead too. Only no one had told me yet, and somehow I was still getting up and going to work and going to clubs, all the while rotting away inside, little by little, day by day. Thing is, my body might have been too busted up to touch Molly anymore, but I was still me, wasn't I? In fact, I was a prior, cruder version of me. One you never had the misfortune of meeting. I guess I've told you bits of the stories still to come. You know I was a junkie once, but perhaps you never did the arithmetic. <laughs> Maybe you're still too young to realise all older folk have a past, have past selves, and you probably wouldn't like them much if you met them. All junkies have a scheming, plotting side. And I'm not saying we're all burglars, muggers, violent, but we all care more about escaping agonising reality than we do about damn near anything else on this earth. So what would you do with that kind of brain when you just lost the love drug of your life? It's a simple fucking question with an even simpler answer. 
like any other love-starved sex addict, you go find another hookup to keep you warm in the night. Another drug that'll lubricate reality, make it tolerable. For me, for the better part of a year, that drug had been intravenous speed. And I told you all about that, didn't I? Me learning how to shoot up all by myself, then our fallen angel contradiction boy Matt insisting I teach him how to shoot up. Followed by Matt going directly down to his fucking kitchen to teach his teenage brother how to stick a needle in his arm the right way, as if such a thing ever existed. It was a hot mess, and for the next several months, all of us bounced around in that toxic speed freak clusterfuck, shooting up and never sleeping, revving the engines of our bodies, riding the red line between 5am and a heart attack, until I fell out of love with Matt, and all that was over, almost certainly saving both our lives. But the speed? I never expected the fucking speed to be over too. I was the one with the contacts, the dealers, not Matt. I thought I was in control, like me and amphetamine were a forever thing. You always do at that age. You haven't experienced enough change to know that nothing is permanent, and anything you come to love can and will be torn away from you. Because the thing is, speed makes people paranoid. <laughs> especially the people who are legitimately breaking the law, staring down a decade or more behind bars. That's how it went with my dealer. I never met the guy, the real guy, the cook, the one spinning that super strength speed up in his bathtub, but my dealer, Nick, clearly revered the guy. Paranoid Nick was a speed freak too, or at least I think he was. <laughs> He was that weird species of druggie who's always so tweaked out. You legitimately never know if he was always like that, even at school, like a hardcore ADHD case, or whether all the drugs just broke his brain and the gibbering wreck they'd left him. That could end up being any one of your friendship group. Could even end up being you. Every damn time a doctor labels me manic when I feel fine, I think to myself, fuck me, is it all the drugs I used to do? Do people look at me and see a gibbering wreck like paranoid Nick? Who fucking knows? That's the gamble you take when you live like this. You toss your whole life, your whole personality onto the table staking it all against one night out that you'll never forget. That's literally the trade-off. So, was Paranoid Nick one of the ones who lost the game? Was he once a calm, curious kid who grew into a lanky, curious teen, who gambled it all on a few twisted nights out and emerged a shuddering, nervy, twitchy portrait of shell shock? Maybe. But it was a sad fucking day when he told me about the cook, the speed guy. Man, I, I never even told Nick I was injecting the stuff. He would have wigged out completely and never sold to me again. As it was, the quantities I was buying made him nervous. Not about the legal ramifications, but just about me dying of a fucking heart attack. Go easy on it, man, he'd say words tripping over garbled words. There's nothing of you, and this batch had my heart doing well weird stuff all weekend. Tell your boyfriend the same. And that's how it had been for a straight year. Nick and me and Matt all whizzing around the world in the same heightened state of twitchy, spun-out glee until the train came off its tracks completely. No more, said Nick, as he climbed into the passenger seat of my battered old 96 Clio. He was in an oversized hoodie and jeans that hung off his spindly, hyperactive frame, mildly stoned by this point in the evening. No more speed, he repeated as he glanced into the back of the car, then peered twitchily through all the windows looking for cops or spies or whatever else haunted the surreal oil paint smudges of his ketamine nightmares. Can't get speed anymore. What do you mean? I said dumbly. 
it was too big a concept, too huge a shift for my brain to wrap itself around. Is the guy on vacation? When's he getting back? Nick shook his head, reddened eyes still scanning the parking lot behind my head. He's not on vacation. He's quit. Got paranoid, packed up shop. There's no more speed. I've been looking, but there's nothing out there. I didn't even have the sense to be horrified. Not yet. Our town was rife with drugs. You'd never know it. Not on the surface. It was a decent place to live. Suburban, largely middle class. But the thing is, it was boring as shit there. And like I said, it was middle class. The kids had money and nothing to do with it. And that means guaranteed drugs. Dealers in a place like that, they're not about stabbing each other over territory. They're all friends because the way you deal, it's not through standing on a street corner waiting. It's all word of mouth, a secret underground world only accessible to those in the know. So the more dealers you're friends with, the more of a client base you all have. Dealers recommend each other and they expect the same back. It's friendly, cooperative, drama-free. And it means that once you're in with one of them, you can get just about any weird drug under the sun, from your typical offenders to weird research chemicals like 2CE and 2CB, which were just making a name for themselves back then. But anyway, my point is, I wasn't freaked out by the fact Nick couldn't get speed anymore because he wasn't the only dealer in town. Even when I shot up that final hit of super strength speed, I never thought to make a big thing out of it, like a proper ritualistic goodbye to a huge chapter of my life. Something that sounds really dumb, but that might have helped me kind of say goodbye to it. That's how convinced I was that someone would have something soon. But they didn't. Spring rolled into summer. The heat wave dragged agonisingly by. There was still no fucking speed. Not anywhere. MDMA was plentiful, but that just made me sick now. And besides, it was a weekend drug. What the fuck was I meant to do during the week? On the daily? The way I'd been using speed like a giant addict? That was what I wanted. What my self-destructive ADHD brain yearned for. And in its absence, I lost the ability to function completely. The exhaustion when you're newly clean from speed is unfucking believable You get used to being able to perform at 300% human capacity and now your body's so battered and used up, it feels more like 2%. Everything is sluggish, lead heavy. Reality feels so fucking dull. Nothing is interesting. Nothing shines. The sunshine feels like a cruel joke. And you're drinking coffee after coffee, munching caffeine gum, caffeine mint, swallowing pro plus caffeine pills by the handful. None of it works. It never feels the same. It never feels right. But you know what's even worse? This is only the speed part of the equation. I'd been injecting it for a full year now. And the addiction you get to the needles themselves after that length of time, it borders on a fetish. It becomes a need as intense as food or water or oxygen. You become that laboratory rat, the one that starves to death, because it'd rather sit there and press the get me high, get me high button all day and all night till it keels over from a heart attack. And even when you take away the drugs and the button stops working, that brain-fried rat fuck will still be sitting there, bug-eyed and skeletal, slamming away at the button in the desperate hope that someday, sometime, if he presses it just right, it'll still give him that beautiful feeling. That rat was me. If you've ever been skinny, you'll know what your arms look like in summer. The minute you get warm, every vein in your forearms just pops right to the surface. And if you're a needle junkie, all you'll see in a heat wave is temptation. The smooth blue bulges of veins running like chemical highways across the muscle of your forearms, like they're pleading to be impaled, 
like your favourite veins become a hungry mouth and now it's begging, begging, begging to be fed. And it had been that way for a while now. <laughs> Whenever I took a hot bath and all my veins rose to the surface, I'd have to do a shot of speed. Even if it was bedtime and I needed to sleep, I just couldn't deny the hungry addict mouths of my veins until, well, now. Because now I had nothing, nothing at all to feed them. I dreamed endless cyclical nightmares of scoring drugs, cooking up drugs, but then I'd always wake drenched in sweat just before I could get them in me. When Matt came over, still a friend despite the breakup, he was in just as bad shape as I was. We sat in my room, the epicenter of our addiction, the place we'd shot ourselves and each other up so many times, me blocking the bedroom door while Matt did his stuff, then him swapping to take my place, and now here we were. I had all the kit, the needles, the sterile spoons, the alcohol wipes and filters, but we had nothing to shoot with it. I just want something, anything I can do that with, Matt muttered irritably for the eleventh time as he flicked cigarette ash out the window. That was what we used to call it, doing that, not shooting up or injecting or anything so specific, anything that made it sound real, hardcore, junkie-ish and scary. We'd just say, are you going to do that with it? It made a decently anonymous code around our friends, but mostly it let us remain in glorious denial about how serious what we were doing actually was. We weren't junkies, addicts. We weren't in danger. We were just doing that. I haven't done that in nearly three fucking months, Matt continued. I'd sell my gran for a hit of bass right now. I started to commiserate, telling him about the way my veins looked at me when I got hot in the bath, about the way his veins were looking at me right now. Because Matt had these gorgeous veins, the same as he had gorgeous everything. They ran like thick blue ridges over the smooth, strong musculature of his arms, barely concealed by his deep olive complexion. And right now, they made my junky brain salivate, it was a horrible sort of agony, the way my mind ran for the 11 millionth time over every substance in the house, every potential substance in town, anything I could inject. And as usual, came up empty. But Matt wasn't listening. His eyes had lit upon the bottle of Jack in the corner of my room. He didn't even bother asking where I kept my stuff. We might have broken up, but when it came to drugs and needles, it was still Mikasa Sukasa for Matt. So he opened up my cupboard and fetched out the brown paper needle exchange bag. Fuck are you doing? I asked. I told you, I've got nothing. There's not. I'm going to try Jack Daniels, he stated, tearing open the sterile packaging on a one mil insulin pin. Alcohol is sterile, isn't it? Why the fuck shouldn't I do that with it? It's got to be better than nothing. Oh, fuck's sake, Matt, I groaned. This is a horrible idea. Whiskey's got... Oh, Jesus, I don't even know what whiskey's got in it, but you can't fucking shoot it up. Well, have you got vodka, he asked. I bet vodka's cleaner. You know I hate vodka. <laughs> That's all I've got. You can stick it up your ass, you know, he told me as he began sterilising a spoon, then pouring a splosh of liquor into it. Goes straight through the membranes and gets you wasted. This is really no different. It's pretty different, Matt. And Ash tried a vodka enema at Whitby once. He did hardly any and it got him absolutely shit-faced, so go easy on it, please, if you're going to do this at all. If I have to call an ambulance with my parents here, they will murder us. I genuinely don't care, said Matt, with his typical level of consideration, drawing up six units of amber liquid, then grabbing the grotty old rope we always used as a tourniquet know how you feel, I conceded, but for the record, I am telling you this is a terrible idea, and I will be telling you I told you so when it all goes horribly wrong. I'll have it inscribed on your fucking tombstone. Christ, I bet it burns like all hell. You're mental. Matt just flashed me a cheeky grin, snapped the tourniquet around his upper arm, and yanked it tight. He bit down on the end and stabbed the needle into the crook of his arm. 
I watched a gush of blood blossom instantly into the barrel, Matt spitting out the tourniquet and muttering, typical, easy as fuck now I've got nothing worth doing it with. He smoothly adjusted his grip on the syringe and sent that untested liquid swirling directly into his bloodstream. I had all my fingers in my mouth as I watched in wide-eyed horror. He pulled out the empty needle, then sat, waiting for death or glory. I barely dared blink. Every junky fear span through my brain, from overdoses and seizures to abscesses and collapsed veins and fucking amputations, until Matt just laughed, saying, Fuck, I can taste it. Three seconds later, he reported, You know, I actually felt that. It's quite nice, really. Worth doing, I demanded, torn between my distrust of this deeply unwise idea and my desperate desire to shoot something, anything, right now. He shook his head. You hate being drunk, don't bother. If I wasn't driving back, I'd do it a few more times, but honestly, it's no different than drinking shots. God, I hate this. How can the whole of Birmingham have no speed in it? We went back to bemoaning our situation as Matt packed the needles away. Even after he left me alone with my thoughts, I wasn't tempted to try shooting whiskey. Just as Matt had said, I didn't even like the stuff, not really. But something about watching him do that, just jack up a completely untested substance, it cracked open a really dangerous door inside my mind. What if, I wondered. What if it didn't have to be speed that I injected? What if I could find something that was just vaguely in the same ballpark? It didn't have to be perfect. It just had to be better than nothing, right? Cocaine was no good. <laughs> I knew that from bitter experience. It was the devil itself in a needle. And we'll get to those stories in about a week or so. You couldn't function on that shit. What I needed was a smoother, longer-acting stimulant, so... What about coffee? Could I, as stupid and weird as it sounds, shoot up coffee? <laughs> With an ounce more care than Matt had demonstrated, I didn't just run out and try it. I went to my usual source for all drug-related information, the Blue Light Forum, where I rapidly discovered that shooting coffee had been attempted and was not a good idea. Coffee was basically just processed plant material, they said. It had all manner of crap in it. Crap that wasn't clever to stick in your veins. And besides that, caffeine was such a shit drug. Why the fuck would you take such huge risks for such little payoff? Don't be dumb. That was the verdict. So I wrote off the coffee idea. But I still had one more theory. Typical me. There was a drug that Ash and I used to use as teenagers, an over-the-counter decongestant that was a distant chemical cousin to amphetamines and did act as a mild, if not particularly pleasant at all, stimulant. Pseudoephedrine. What would happen, I wondered, if I injected that stuff? Would it be speedy at all? It didn't have to be perfect, it just had to be something. I just needed that rush, that feeling, that fucking clarity. I didn't know, of course, that the reason I needed it so hard was that I had undiagnosed ADHD and should actually have been prescribed stimulants to treat it. And had that happened, I reckon I never would have got into any of this shit, I never would have started shooting up, I never would have destroyed my body in the first place. There was a reason that speed felt right, that it felt necessary. But I was a child of the 80s and 90s when girls did not have ADHD and mental health issues were swept violently under the rug. So I was left to my own devices. I just jumped back on blue light and searched up intravenous pseudoephedrine. And well, this is where the story gets scary. This is where it gets really, really stupid. Stupid and scary kind of go hand in hand, don't they? Haven't you ever noticed the way the airheads die first and most horribly in horror movies? 
pay attention to that. The moral of this story is, don't be dumb. It gets you dead, especially in the drug world. Because no matter what search terms I put in, I couldn't find a single word about shooting decongestant medications. And instead of realising that this meant no one had ever done it and lived to tell the tale, I was so desperate for a fix, I decided to take that completely untested drug, ram it in my veins, and make myself the guinea pig for the entire human race. It was time for injection roulette. I wasn't even nervous as I sat down with my box of pseudoephedrine, peeled the outer coating off a pill or two, then mashed them up with water. I wasn't scared about pumping this unknown drug directly into my bloodstream to go sloshing wildly through the tissues of my brain. I was just hyper-focused on getting back that rush. In the spoon, I soon had a large clump of white goo. It wasn't dissolving well, but that, I figured, was to be expected with pills. They weren't designed to be injected, so maybe don't inject them. Of course there'd be a lot of insoluble fillers, so I just got on with it, sucking up as much of the liquid as I possibly could till I had most of a barrel filled with clear solution. I was genuinely excited as I snapped the tourniquet on, bit down and spiked a vein. It had been far, far too long, and now, at last, my eternity in sober purgatory was over. Maybe. I forced down the plunger, watched that clear, cold liquid slip away into my bloodstream, then I whipped out the empty needle and waited. Because it's not like in the movies, IV drug use, you know, where they start nodding out the very second they begin depressing the plunger. Mm -mm. It takes round about three seconds for the drug to travel from your arm to your heart and from there to be pumped up to your brain where it hits you. Three seconds, three heartbeats. Or at least that's how it goes with my low blood pressure. I waited. The seconds ticked by. And then... Nothing. Fucking nothing happened. Diddly squat, zilch, nada. All that white goop sitting in the spoon, that was the pseudoephedrine. The stuff was not even water soluble. There was no way of getting it into a vein. So I stewed in disappointment and the building fury for precisely three more seconds. Until I realised there was still a way to try this out. See, pseudoephedrine was only one of the stimulant chemicals used in over-the-counter decongestants. For fuck's sake, give up while you're still ahead. There was another, phenylephrine, which was weaker as far as stimulants went, but still provided enough of a mild lift that I'd been stashing and eating it all summer, along with the coffee and the caffeine gum, anything I could grab in a desperate and failed attempt to regain that speedy feeling. I'd never heard of anyone injecting phenylephrine, but right now, with a needle in my hand and all my hopes dashed, I couldn't have stopped myself if I'd tried. My junky brain had taken the wheel, 100%. Besides, I figured, that first unknown chemical had been so sodding useless. If anything went wrong with this one, it'd be the same deal, right? A glorious rush or nothing at all. What did I have to lose? Quite a lot, as it would turn out. But you know the statistics, don't you? When it comes to Russian roulette, I mean. If you survive once, you walk the fuck away. Because the bullet in that chamber, the one with your name on, it's just getting closer and closer with every click of the trigger. But just like Matt... I didn't care. I did not fucking care in that moment about anything. Anything but feeling the way I needed to feel. I needed that rush, and now the idea had been born, there was no way of shoving it back into the womb. If I didn't do it now, I knew it would only tickle round and round my brain till it drove me insane, and I did it anyway. A bad idea is the most dangerous, unstoppable thing in the world when you're an addict. So... 
on junky autopilot, all free will flown, I cleaned the white goop out of my spoon, then plucked two sunny yellow phenylephrine capsules from the packet, emptied their contents into the spoon, and added water. It almost entirely dissolved this time. That had to be a good sign, didn't it? I was going to get something in me this time. And it never once occurred to me that just because you can take a substance orally does not mean it's safe to put in a vein at the same dosage or at all. I mean, Christ, hot chocolate's the safest comfort food in the world, but I suspect it would kill you dead if you injected it. I didn't think about that. I was so desperate, I didn't think about anything. The powder had dissolved so cleanly this time, it left nothing but a tiny scatter of crystals in the depths of the spoon. I sucked it all up into the same syringe as before, gave it a flick, pushed out all the air, till clear liquid beaded at the hair-fine tip of the needle. My favourite vein was a little bloodied and swollen from that first stab, but nothing I hadn't worked round before. I pierced it a few millimetres higher, watched the blood flower gush into the barrel, then I shifted my grip and started forcing down the plunger. Someone, something, was looking over me that day. I would fucking swear on that fact. An ancestral spirit? An angel? Patron saint of the hapless junkies? To this day, I don't know. The supernatural had yet to touch my conscious mind back then. I still believed hunches came from myself, a sixth sense, the way most people egotistically claim. These days, I know better. You don't often see a ghost, but you feel them a lot. Because I'd never, ever, not once, done this in my life before. But in that moment, something... Something made me hesitate, stop short when the plunger was only halfway down. I ceased forcing that unknown liquid into my bloodstream and thought, wait and see, just wait and see before you do the rest. And I owe my entire fucking life to that action, to that spirit, whoever they were. Because the very second I paused... I started to feel it. There was no three-second wait, not with this stuff. No three heartbeats, then boom, the drug hit me instantly and it was strong enough to make me whip the needle still half full out of my arm. I knew I wouldn't need the rest. But for a sixteenth of a second, I was actually smiling. Like, I genuinely thought I was onto something. There was a buzzing in my ears, a weird feeling like a plane taking off. And I had just enough time to think, I've fucking done it. I've actually done it. I found a new drug with a decent rush. The bad times are over. The second my elation registered, the whole world just fucking ruptured. The chemical flowed through my heart, then was sent shooting into the tissues of my brain and pain split my fucking head in two. My whole brain was screaming in agony as the caustic fluid saturated its delicate membranes. My body temperature skyrocketed till I could feel boiling blood flooding the membranes of my face. My stomach twisted inside me and I barely managed to lean over the bin before I projectile vomited bitter bile into its depths. My heart was pounding like a freight train, shaking my whole body, and as the pain in my head intensified to a screaming train whistle of agony, I knew I'd made a fatal error. The drug was burning me from the inside out. It was corroding the tissues of my brain, a self-induced chemical lobotomy. Packets of cold pills littered the floor in front of me, along with needles, spoons, the tourniquet still hanging loose around my elbow. Through the screeching, throbbing agony, I wondered whether to hide the evidence. So when my mother opened the door and found my corpse, she wouldn't have to know how stupid I'd been. But what if she found me still breathing? Wouldn't it be better to leave the evidence there? so the paramedics knew what species of total fucking idiocy they were treating. But 
There was no way I was making it through this. I knew that. Every bodily system was failing. I couldn't see straight. My vision had become a distant tunnel covered in wild neon sparkles. The pain in my head was unlike anything I'd ever felt before. My heart racing and skipping beats simultaneously, my flesh on fire. In the end, the decision wasn't mine to take. I didn't have the strength to tidy all that shit away. I was going to die the stupidest death known to man and everyone would know it. I threw up another gush of stomach acid, then shakily hauled off my sweat-drenched t-shirt, fumbling to turn the fan on full blast as I dragged myself over to the mirror. My whole body had flushed beet red, but the most disturbing thing was my eyes. My pupils had blown completely. All there was to see through the blurry, shuddering haze of my dying vision were two huge black orbs dilated to manic proportions. I'd never seen them so big nor so vacant, even on the best ecstasy in England. But she was there with me for the very last time. The mirror girl? I told you all about her, didn't I? About that, I mean. What mirrors meant to me when I was younger. Grow up a lonely kid in a room with a full wall of mirrors and your reflection becomes your best and only friend. Whatever I was going through, the mirror girl got it. She lived in a room that looked identical to mine and whenever I went out, she went out. I could find her anywhere in any bathroom. I just had to hide in a stool, pull out a mirror, then there she was. My closest confidant in the whole wide world. We'd commiserate with each other's suffering. She understood me, 100%. We had a billion in-jokes because we'd shared every millisecond of our lives. My reflection was another person to me, one I could always rely on, the identical twin I'd always longed for. And now here she was, dying right along with me. Seeing her made me feel better, though, the way it always did. I wasn't dying now, a lonesome, lost little me. We were dying, and whatever awaited us on the other side, we'd meet it together, the same way we met everything. But I was too ill, in too much pain, to stay with her. I had to break away from her flushed face, her dilated, spacey eyes, and collapse back on the carpet, the fan blasting cold air at me as I arranged myself in the recovery position and awaited my fate. It was fucking stupid. I had a phone, but I still didn't have the stones to dial 999. And honestly, my brain felt so stupefied, I didn't even know if I could speak if I did. The pain in my head rose to a shrieking crescendo, but the cold air hitting the scalding skin of my face felt good. I dunked one shaking hand into my glass of water, smudged the cold liquid over my forehead, cheeks, chest, let the fan evaporate it away, anything to cool my dangerously overheated body. I should have gotten a cold bath, but I didn't have the strength to get there. So I just lay on my side, the white noise of the fan battering into my face, and little by little, my heart started to slow. The nausea was lessening. The pain in my corroded brain cells began to fade. As my heartbeat dropped to a heavy, erratic thumping, I crawled to the mirror once more, and this time my reflection wasn't half so disturbing. My skin had blanched pale, bar the fiery, feverish dots marking each cheek my pupils no longer so vastly dilated. I knelt in front of the mirror, watched the feverish blush fade away, watched my pupils shrink to their normal size until all that remained was one sweat-drenched, shell-shocked kid. On the carpet in front of me, five units of phenylephrine remained in the syringe, the exact same dose I'd gotten inside me. So what would have happened if I'd taken it all? A double dose. <laughs> I told you so. Someone, something, was watching over me that day. There's no rational explanation as to why I didn't just slam the plunger all the way home. 
It's what I'd done every other time I'd ever shot up anything. I never did half measures, but if I'd gone the whole hog this time, would I be brain damaged? Would I have had a heart attack, a seizure, fatal overheating, all of the above? Would I be here telling you this stupid story right now, or would I be nothing more than a 21-year-old face fading away on a cremation stone from 2007? I can see the latter far, far too clearly. You know, I've heard about junkies shooting up Windex, bleach even. Anything they've convinced themselves contains some chemical that might, just maybe, give them what they need. I don't even know what's scarier. The fact we do these things, or the fact we sometimes survive. Clueless to how close we really came. Because the thing is, we can't see our own insides. We can't see that those ugly molecules of drugs never fit for intravenous consumption are now lodged forever in the tissues of our brains or the filtration systems of our lungs, a ticking time bomb. All I know is that whoever, whatever, stopped me from shooting the lot that day, they'd clearly decided that it was just too stupid too embarrassing a way for me to go out. <laughs> I mean, bloody hell, the amount of actual drugs I'd been doing, how in hell's name could it be an over-the-counter cold medication that took me out? All because my stupid junky ass had decided to draw it up into a needle and inject the rotten shit. Somehow, for some miraculous reason, becoming a Darwin Award of colossal magnitude wasn't to be my fate. At least, it wasn't to be my fate that day. Because whatever spirit or angel was on my side that summer weekend, they couldn't protect me from myself forever. Doing that would be a full-time job and then some. They couldn't hold off the inevitable. The same thing would happen again with a different chemical further on down the road. It was never drugs that put me in danger, see? That's my justification. It was those times I didn't have drugs and I had to get creative. That was when things went from messy but functional into an absolute spiralling hellscape. There would be, a next time, another crack at chemical roulette. Only this time there would be ambulances and organ damage wires and beeping monitors flowing in and out of all my veins. And you know the most fucking ironic thing of all? Everyone thought I was doing fine. All this was going on, and no one even knew I had a drug problem. As far as my family were concerned, I finally had my shit together. My hair was long and blonde, no more crazy teenage colours. I had a job as personal assistant to the CEO of an engineering firm. My life was in order and my future was bright. It came out of nowhere, they thought, when I finally overdosed on the bizarrest chemical soup imaginable. They never saw what was going on behind the velvet curtain, the carefully curated bullshit stage set of my life. None of you fucking saw. Until now. Are you ready for the truth? And I guess that's where we'll leave it for this one. Anna, uh, jump back in next chapter with uh, with, with more of, of, of the mess that was actually going on behind uh, me being a shiny blonde personal assistant that everyone thought was doing fine. Yeah, injection roulette. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, I mean, I've... I know I'm not the only one, the only kind of junkie who has done this kind of shit. Because, you know, I've seen enough programs where people have talked about the things they've shot up and they had nothing, like no actual drugs to shoot up. They've convinced themselves, they've read, you know, the labels on household chemicals and all kinds of shit. And they've convinced themselves this will do something good for me. I'm going to take this. Uh, no, nah. I mean, you know, even when it's 
even when it's street drugs that you've been doing for ages, you don't know what's going to be in a particular batch. You, you don't know, you know, you're putting yourself at so much risk every time you decide to shoot something and to take something that you, even the main chemical you're after is untested is really, 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 really stupid. And the fact that I did not die on the carpet that day, as I say, there was... I am convinced something, someone was in the room looking over me that day. Um, and I say that partly because while I've been reading <laughs> this story, there is a very definite presence in the room with me that has been making me kind of emotional as I've been reading. There's icy cold air around me right now. Um, so I think, yeah, um, I had never in my life as a junkie before had I paused in the middle of shooting something and gone, Let's just wait and see about this. I didn't do it with pseudoephedrine, the first chemical I did that was untested. I slammed that straight home and it, nothing happened. So that gave me even more confidence that it's either going to work or it's going to do nothing. You're fine. But something made me fucking hesitate. Something made me only get half of it in me. And then I stopped. And I think that saved my life. I really do. And I'm just going to pop in here because honestly, I got so flustered by the fact I could feel this ice cold presence in the room with me while I was making this video. I got too flustered to say some of the most obvious things, which are obviously, please never, ever try to reenact anything talked about in this video. It was the dumbest thing. I nearly died. It felt awful. I would say if you are an addict, particularly if you are an intravenous addict, you do need to be really, really careful if there's ever a situation where the drugs go away, you can't get the drugs and your brain starts playing tricks on you and doing stupid stuff where you think, I need, I need something to give me that feeling and I don't care what it is and I don't care what risks I put myself in to get that feeling back like if you're starting to think like that you need to for starters make sure there are no flipping needles in your house get rid of them all I know you don't want to because you didn't quit out of choice you know the drugs went away you you didn't quit out of choice you're hoping they'll come back it doesn't matter get rid of the needles you can get more anytime just just get them out of the house and that will stop any spontaneous bad decisions of this magnitude so that would be the first thing I would say to do other than that please get yourself a therapist I mean I'm one of these people who doesn't feel that Narcotics Anonymous Alcoholics Anonymous is is the kind of thing for me I don't really like the way they think about a lot of things but get a therapist for god's sake get a therapist if you're going through this kind of thing um but, you know, give Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous a go. At least they're there, like, every night if you need somewhere to go and be. I think there's a lot of people who go to these meetings who don't agree with everything they say, but they just want the companionship and the distraction. So that's worth a thought. But get all the needles out of your house and never consider doing anything like this. And if you don't already shoot up, it's not something that you want to get into because the level of head fuck involved is ridiculous. And the next story I will be telling you does concern more of that and more of the really, really shitty places that being so hardcore into needles got me. So anyway, if you are interested in more stories like this, I will leave the Nostalgia Project playlist below. Um, and uh, yes, a huge, huge thank you to the Patreon people for helping keep this project going because obviously YouTube does not like to monetize stories that are about terrible, terrible decisions like this, even though I would I would hope that hearing this story makes so people hesitate before doing things like this and getting into things like this. YouTube, does, YouTube doesn't want to touch it and that's fairly understandable. Um, so huge thank yous to the Patreon people for letting me continue to tell the disastrous stories of my disastrous life. <laughs> I am 37 this year if I get there, knock on wood, um, and uh, I could have died in a very, very stupid way in my early 20s. I mean, there are so many, like say, we ain't even done with the stupid stories, we ain't even done with the chemical roulette. Um, there's more to come. So. I, you know, I, I do often say I am I am basically Keith Richards. I am a cockroach person. I am one of those creatures that, you know, just doesn't die, does all the stupid things and just somehow doesn't die. Um, <laughs> don't deserve to be here in any way, shape or form, but somehow I am. So uh, hello <laughs> and uh, over and out for now. Thank you for listening. Bye bye.